So I want to open up with uh, Matthew uh, 24. Pastor's brought some really good messages the last couple Sundays, and I kind of just want to touch and add on to what he was talking about. And I want to talk to you today about the, the fire of God. But before we really go into that, I want you to know exactly about what's going on in the world right now. And why are we seeing the things that we are seeing? So Matthew 24, I'm going to start from verse 1. And if you don't know, this is one of the passages that Jesus talks about the end times in the last days. If you aren't aware of this, if you don't know this yet, we are living in the last times, or the last days. It says, as Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth. They will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and said, Master, tell us, when will all these things happen? What signs will signal your return? and the end of the world. And Jesus looked at them and told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name, claiming I am the Messiah. And they will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats. Threats of wars. But do not panic. And you can see this playing out today. Wars, rumors of war. Look what's going on in Afghanistan. That's stirring up such a thing. In the Middle East, like we don't know what's going to happen. So we don't know who's going to shoot first, what bomb's going to go off. There's many things that's going to happen. He said, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And if you read this in the Amplified Version, it says, that there will be civil unrest. And you can see that in our very eyes. What's been going on during this whole pandemic? People protesting, marching, Antifa, cities being burned down. Left wing, right wing going at it with each other. There is complete civil unrest in today's society. And he says there will be famines. And the King James says, and pestilence. If you don't know what pestilence is, it's uncurable sickness and diseases. Unless you've been living under a rock or you're from the Amish country, we are in a pandemic. And it says, and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But this is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. And if you're unfamiliar with what birth pains are, if you're a woman, and I mean a biological woman, and you're about to give birth, the closer you are to giving birth, the more intense and the more frequent the contractions will be. So when you see these things happening more frequently, which we are, more diseases will come, more civil unrest, more famine, more pestilence, all these things. He says, watch, because I am coming near. He says, then you will be arrested and persecuted and killed. Look what's literally going on in Afghanistan today. I was just reading an article that literally... The Taliban's going door to door, going through people's phones, looking for who has the Bible app, and, murder, and murdering them on the spot. Yeah, it's happening right now in the Middle East. You will be, you're persecuted. In China, and I'm talking about 2021, you can't even have a Bible. If you're caught with a Bible, that is six years in jail. Six years for one Bible. You will be hated all over the world. If you haven't noticed, Christians are the most hated group. Whenever they're given about the new regulations, they make sure to always mention the restriction on specifically churches. Never synagogues. Never, never other temples. Always churches. It said, you will be hated all over the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. You can see that today. The love of many people has gone cold. Human interaction is, is pretty much dead. They're more in tune with their phones than they are to the person next to them. Somebody, you can walk, like compassion is lost. I, we live downtown. I walk to Young and Dundas. You can see 
You could literally stand there and have someone cry, and nobody would bat an eye. Like in my building, there was a family moving out of their unit, and uh, I walked by, and I saw them struggling. It was an older couple with a heavy couch. That's a recipe for disaster. And I asked them, like, hey, do you guys need a hand? They're like, we've seen people here all day. We've moved all of our furniture, and they live on the 42nd floor. From the 42nd floor down to the 5th, and you are the first person all day to ask. The love of many will grow cold. Sin will be rampant everywhere. You can't turn on social media without seeing something God calls sin. And the love of many will grow cold. But the one who endures to the end shall be saved. And quickly turn over. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Don't worry, it's not going to be a very depressing teaching. I just want to make your eyes open as to what's actually going in and around, around the 2 Timothy chapter 3. It says, you should know this, Timothy. This is the Apostle Paul writing to his son of the faith. That in the last days, there will be very difficult times. For people will only love themselves and their money. You could see people boastful, proud. All it is is all about the bling, all about the drip, all about who has the newest, nicest stuff, but there's no substance to it. There is such a high level of greed, and people will literally sell themselves for money. And you can see during this pandemic, how many innocent people. I, I've read articles about pastors Who've, shut, who've locked down their church and left away from the faith to start an OnlyFans as their only means to survive. We're talking about pastors. <laughs> For the money. And they will be boastful and proud. Today, how many people are willing to admit that, hey, I'm wrong. I messed up. No, they will die with the lie. They will... They will go down and say, no, I'm the best. They refuse to be taught. They will be scoffers at God. Today I saw uh, another, I know I, say I, saw, I see a lot of things, but it just ends up coming up, so I end up watching it. There's a, there's a guy here in Toronto, David Lynn. Love him, hate him. I'm a, he, he was doing some baptisms in a public place, and there was people coming, yelling, cursing, mocking God while he was doing something sacred, which was baptizing people in water, Bla completely blaspheming God, disobedient to their parents. We live in a me first generation. You don't tell me what to do. Nobody in our generation likes authority and ungrateful. They will consider nothing sacred. And you can see this. All you got to do is flip on social media. All you got to do is talk to, to some of your friends, some of your people in school, some of your colleagues at work, and you will see all these things that I have just mentioned. And these are a signal. These are a sign that we are living in the final hour of the very last day. And then he says, they will slander others who have no self-control. They will be cruel and hate what is good. They will, be, they will betray friends. They will be reckless. Be re How many? Hashtag savage. They will be puffed with pride. They would love pleasure rather than love God. Everybody's acting out on their own impulses. Everybody acts out what I want to do. I I know what the Bible says, but this is how I feel, even though it contradicts the word. Your feelings do not dictate what is right. God's word is eternal. He is the author and the finisher. We are in this world, but we need to live by what he calls sin is sin. And call it what it is. Don't call it a struggle. Don't call it a quirk. Don't call it a demon. If you have a demon that you're battling, come to church, get delivered, and be set free. And they will act religious. I like how it says better in the King James Version. They will have a form of godliness, but deny the power that will make them godly. 
There's many people that come to church, they know how to act right. They know how to dress right. They know when it's time to sing, they sing. They know when it's time to speak in tongues, they speak in tongues. They know when, it, when it's time to pray, they pray. There's many people that come, they tune into their lives, they come to church, they go to the hall, but it's just all a facade, a form of godliness. They are led by their flesh. They are led by their desires. They are not led by what the Spirit is saying. They are so out of tune. And the Bible doesn't just say, it says, stay away from these people. Don't talk them out of it. Don't try to conform. Don't say, hey, brother, stay away from these people. And that's not, religion is not the standard that Jesus has called us to live as Christians. If you don't know the word Christians, it means little Christs. Meaning we are to operate the way that Jesus operated, His love, His compassion, His joy, the way that He was when He was on this earth is the same way that we are supposed to operate. We are His hands and His feet. Jesus actually said in John 14, 12, the same work that you saw me do, you shall do also, and greater works. See, we are living in the final moment of the last days. So don't be ignorant. Look what's all around you. Look what I just mentioned. In these final days, there will be many troubled times. Look at the economy. Look what's going on in the world. There's restriction here, restriction there. Gas prices going up, which sucks. House prices skyrocketed. The economy's terrible. Freedom of speech is now being put in a bubble. You can't, you got to like be careful of what you say, otherwise you're going to be sued. These are signs of the end times. And if you haven't read this manual yet, you will be caught blind. But if you were studying to show yourself approved as what scripture said, this wouldn't be news to you. You would be waiting eagerly. You know, hey, Jesus said these things are going to happen. So I'm going to get my act together. But this isn't just for you to get your act together. Malachi chapter 3 it's uh, 318. It says that in these days there will be a difference between the righteous and the unrighteous, between those who serve God and those who do not. So even though the world is going to complete crap, even though the world is living in fear, you are not caught off guard. You will not fit in with them. You are going to shine and shine brightly. Isaiah 818 says, Me and my children, we are for signs and wonders on this earth. And that is what the uh, Christians are. And that is why we are called to be the church. And the church in Greek com uh, comes from the word ekklesia, which means the called out ones. You have been called out of the world and called into the family of God. So that's the identity you got to take. Now when you're living, when you see these signs, when you understand that this is the world that we're living in, you got to know your root. You got to know your covenant with God. You got to know what he said. Psalms 91. A lot of people forgot about it. It was popular two years ago. But now when things just got from bad to worse, it's like, hey, we stop reading. God's word hasn't changed. Your faith did. Psalms 91, 18. These evils shall not touch you. So don't be ignorant. Understand where we are and understand you are not going to fit into what happens to the world. You will have a completely different outcome. How many of you were here for the past few weeks and Pastor was preaching these two uh, series? Do you remember what they were? Do you remember? Do you remember? Anybody? Pastor, you got to throw him to let them or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? So no one's taking the advice that we learned to read over our notes during breakfast. Great job. <laughs> no, Sunday. So the first one was the need for the supernatural church. Remember that one? And the second one, which was last Sunday, was what? It was all about what? Fruitfulness. The supernatural church is what's needed for this time. The supernatural church, you can't live in this society, you can't live during this time without being part of the supernatural church. 
But when you see people come to church every single Sunday, and they're not living in that supernatural lifestyle, and you can easily pick them out. They've come in here 5, 10, 15 years ago, and they're still the prayer project. Pastor, I need you to pray for me. Continually. If you're a part of the supernatural church, you gotta, you got to mature in your understanding. you got to go from always needing deliverance to somebody who carries deliverance. There is a process which pastors, for how many, how many messages pastors preach about process? There's a process that you must go to and you can't rely on pastors. You can't rely on your leaders, your mentors. It comes down to you. There's an old song we used to sing in Sunday school. It's not my brother, it's not my father, it's not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. You need to go directly to the source to seek Him. You see, religion does all the nice little outward things. Religion goes to all the teachings. Religion, religion frustrates me, man. Religion will tell you to, hey, oh, you're a woman, you can't wear pants. You're a woman, you shouldn't be wearing any makeup. Some people need makeup. <laughs> I'm not, God didn't make anything ugly, but some people are close. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm joking. No, but religion, it's all on the outward. But God doesn't look on the outward. He looks at the heart. He looks for a right spirit. He looks... For someone whose ears and his heart is turned towards him. And religion completely retract, uh, doesn't attract. It repels people. Religion forces change. you got to do this. We're going to hell. Is that the way that Jesus operated? He said he moved with compassion. He was very compassionate to the sinners, but he was very hard to the religious people. He moved with compassion. And when those people came to him, they didn't stay the same. That's I know if you're being too light. They changed. Their lives were not the same. They became followers and carriers of what he had. So to know if you're, if you're part of the supernatural church, what you carry, what you're doing, reflects, uh, uh, it's, it's mimicable. And... The, the, the last thing they preached was about fruitfulness, which is the first command given to us by God. Be fruitful and multiply. See, we're always called to produce fruit. And what is fruit? I was hoping somebody shouted out, but that's all right. We're here to learn together. Fruit is operating the same thing that Christ did. Same way that Christ did. When you see fruit, what does it have inside of it? A seed. I have an apple. There's apple seeds. Apple seeds go into the ground. What does it do? It creates another apple tree. And the cycle continues. Christ said we do the same work that he did. So when he went out, he healed people. We carry healing. We teach people to carry healing. And the cycle continues. That is fruit. And I'm going to quickly go Luke chapter 3. Oh, sorry, Mark chapter 11. Mark 11, 12. I want you to catch this. The next morning as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry. He noticed a fig tree in full leaf a little way off. So he went over if he could find any figs. But there were only leaves. Catch this part. Because it was too early in the season. If you read it in the, uh, uh, the King James Version, it says, For he knew it was not the time for there to be any fruit. Doesn't matter what season is externally. You must always be producing fruit. When you read this book cover to cover, you will not find a fruitless season for God's children. Jesus said, in in uh, John 15, chapter, uh, John 15, 4, that if, he says, remain in me and I will remain in you. Like a branch produces fruit when it's connected to the, to connected to the vine. You 
cannot produce any fruit if you do not remain in me. So if you remain in Christ, you will always produce fruit. Psalms chapter 1. Verses 1 to 3. One of my favorite passages in Scripture. How do we do that? How do we always remain in Him? Oh, the joys of those who do not follow the advice of the wicked or stand around with the sinners or join in with mockers, but they delight in the law of the Lord, meditating on it day and night. This is what we're doing right now. We are meditating on the word of the Lord. He says, they are like trees planted along the river, bearing fruit in every season. Their leaves never wither, and they prosper in all that they do. No more dry seasons. You will always produce fruit from this day forward. But the only way that you can do this, the only way that you could be part of the supernatural church, the only way that you will be able to consistently produce fruit is if you carry and you are filled with the fire of God. It's the fire that molds you. It's the fire that's going to refine you. It's the fire that gives you boldness. It's the fire where you see passion comes from. There's, there's this, uh, how many of you know Rob Parsley? Yeah, so I started listening to his preachers from like the, the early 90s. I'm talking like <laughs> early Pentecostal. And, he, and there's this, he had this uh, guest speaker come one time, and he's like, he's talking about the anointing and talking about the fire. He's like, I don't know how to say it, but I know who ain't have it. And that's the same thing with the fire of God. You can know instantly. It's by the way they carry themselves, by the way that they talk, who has it and who doesn't have it. You can see this in the life of every single person in, uh, throughout the Bible. Look at the life of David. All he was assigned to do was go meet his brothers and give them cheese sandwiches. But when he heard someone talk smack about his God, something bubbled from the inside of him. That this 16-year-old boy went, who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Something rises up from within you. There is a, fi a boldness, a passion. That is the fire of God. Turn me Luke chapter 3. I'm going to start from verse uh, 16. This is John the Baptist saying, John answered their questions by saying, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is much greater than I am, so much greater that I am not even worthy to be his slave and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. And I've seen a lot, of, bro, I grew up in church. My sister can attest, attest to that. And we would, growing up in church, we'd see a lot of people baptized in the Holy Ghost, but not as many people baptized with fire. They would come in here speaking in tongues and leaving there speaking a different kind of way. They would have a church life, a work life, and then a home life. They were not, and the word baptized means to be submerged. They were not consummated. They were not submerged in the purifying fire of God. This is why the Apostle Paul wrote to Son Timothy in 2 Timothy 1.6, that, that I remind you that ye must fan the flame that you've received by God. It's not up to God to maintain the fire. It is our diligence, our responsibility to be on fire for Him. We need to fan the flame. And like I read moments ago, during these end times, the world is not going to be favorable. And if you're trying to live in the flesh, if you're going to try to live outside of the will of God, you're not going to produce anything. 
But if you are fully submerged in that fire, if you understand the calling, the purpose that God has for you to fulfill, you will fulfill it with, with a, such a grace, such a speed, such strength that people will marvel and look at you saying, God must be with this person. And the fire is something that draws people to feel its warmth. Canada doesn't need any more government programs. We don't need more informational. We don't need any more billboard. I've never been with one person or seen someone going. You guys seen that, like, uh, those billboard ads about, like, uh, abuse? Have you ever talked to an abuser or seen an abuse victim? You know how many times they go by that thing? I've never heard of someone, huh. I'm not going to abuse my wife today. That sign spoke. No. People don't change because of what you tell them. People are a slave to sin. People are changed once they get in, once they have a genuine encounter with the fire and the power of the Holy Ghost. And it's the fire that's going to purify when you go out. It's the fire that's going to release people from oppression. It's the fire that's going to cause people to come to you saying, Hey, I need prayer. I don't know what it is about you, but you're so happy. I'm always down. Can, can, can we just talk? Can we bring friends? The fire is going to cause people to come into you to feel the warmth because it's not you. It's God. It's the Holy Ghost that's living on the inside of you. And that fire is so contagious that it's going to set them free. Hey, uh, when you, Bishop, they had that uh, video queued up. The one of the white guy. I know we're not allowed to say that, but he's white. I'm brown. He's a guy. The chairs are blue. I still use adjectives. One minute. That's a video cute because a lot of people, we come into fire, but you forget to fan the flame. And you forget what it's like to have a burning passion. So what I want to do is I want to stir you up again. I want you to realize that fire you once have, you had if it went out. And I want to encourage you, if you're maintaining a lifestyle of fire, to keep pursuing it. It is the greatest thing that you could do on this earth. It is the greatest. There is no drug on this planet that can compare to, to being consistently consumed by the fire of God. I guess one more minute. So, while they're waiting for that to get on, I can't talk to you about something if you don't know exactly what the fire does and how it affects your life. See, the fire isn't something that, that causes you just to feel numb. The, the, when you have the, the fire of God, just, it's not something that just, oh, the hairs stick up at the back. It's not goosebumps. Let's look to Luke chapter 3. I read this earlier, 16 and verse 17. So John said, I baptize you with water, but someone is coming who is greater than I am, so much greater that I'm not even worthy to be a slave, and I uh, and untie the straps of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire. Verse 17, he is ready to separate the chaff from the wheat with his unwinnowing fork. Then he will clean up the threshing area, gathering the wheat into his barn and burning the chaff with never-ending fire. The first thing that the fire of God does is purify you. 
Galatians chapter, and, and the chaff that he's speaking of is, is the flesh. Galatians chapter 5, the Apostle Paul writes, he talks about how the flesh and the spirit are consistently at war with each other. They don't intertwine. They will intersect. And the one that you feed will be the one that has a dominant driving force in your life. You're either in this life going to be pursuing your purpose or pursuing your pleasure. They will never coincide with each other. And then, and you can't rely on, on that initial character you had one year, five years, 10 or 15 years ago. You need to have a daily infilling, a fresh anointing. David, David said in, in uh, Psalms 92.10, he said that I will be anointed with fresh oil, not stale, not leftover, not oil that I had before, fresh oil. So daily, I'm going to check myself. Daily, I'm going to assess. Daily, I'm going to commune with my Father. Daily, I'm going to dive deep in the Word. Daily, I'm going to seek Him. Daily, I'm going to have an encounter. And daily, I'm going to be filled with the fire from heaven. And then Galatians 5.16, he says that, Then I say this, Walk in the Spirit, then you will not obey the desires of the flesh. When you are walking, you are fully submerged. The flesh is nothing. Your spirit overrides the flesh. Oh, but I thought, you know, we're living in this time. We're in a body. Yeah, we are in a body. Yeah, but I thought the Apostle Paul wrote in uh, Romans 14, in Romans 7, that, you know, the, the flesh is at war with the spirit, and sometimes I don't do what the, the spirit wants to do. Yeah, that's, you got to read it in its context. He was talking about before he was redeemed, he would try and do the right thing. Before, have you ever talked to any drug addicts? Have you ever talked to someone who was on meth or, or heroin? Maybe some, maybe not. They don't want to do those things. They don't experience the same high that they did initially. They want to be set free. They want to be delivered. But there is something that's stopping them from doing the right thing. And that is sin. You think there's people that live out there who want to cheat on their wife, who want to abuse their children? No. Sin is the culprit. And then you continue to read the chapter in verse 7. He says, then who can free us from this? Who can deliver us from sin and death? And then he says, but thank God, Jesus Christ is the one who shall deliver us. Romans 6, 13, sin shall not have dominion over you. Man, I'm speaking to someone online or even here. You're struggling with consistent cycles. You say, oh man, it's, it, it's just this season. Every time the winter happens or every time the summer happens. No, that cuts off tonight. Sin shall not have dominion over you. So I'm telling you, you younger guys. Aim for purity. Aim for righteousness. Aim for holy living. Abby, I think you're the youngest one here. Not this Abby, that Abby. Trust me. Pursue God with all that you are, all that you have, and watch what he's going to do. People are going to marvel, just as he was with Joash. He says he is no respecter of person. If you don't know who Joash is, he was a four-year-old, a four-year-old entrusted to lead the nation of Israel. When you are filled with fire, when you pursue God with everything that you are, you put Him first in everything. He is the one that will lift you up despite of your age. So while you're young, while you're in elementary school, before you get to high school, be filled. Be the difference maker. And watch what God's going to do. He's going to open so many doors, your parents will marvel and wonder. This goes for everybody here. It doesn't matter if you screwed up last week, 10 weeks ago, two months ago. Make the decision to get on. Oh, nice. To get on fire. About time. Oh, I meant to project. Tiny screen. Oh. Oh. Jesus' name. Okay, watch this, watch this.
He's like, why is this doing this to me? Okay, you can cut it, you can cut it. No, but I had that video in there, man. Because look what the fire of God can do. So take somebody that was in jail, who was, who was abusing drugs. That wasn't scripted. That bursted out of his spirit. The fire of God will give you a radical boldness, a radical transformation. When you are consumed and submerged with the fire of God, you have a different outlook and perception of life. There's a strong conviction, like he, his doctor could use some work, but there, there was a genuine urge and passion to get the message out there. That death and the world is not where I belong. I belong in God's family. And this is the second point. The second point, that the fire allows you to do the fire of God empowers us. Acts 1.8 You shall receive Oh wow, that was sad. Two people knew their Bible. Power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you. See, what point is, is, is being clean? What point is just being purified if we don't do anything? A clean church is, okay, that's great. But we need to have power. Power for what? We receive power to be my witnesses. Being a witness of Christ carries power. And the fire of God allows you to become an effective witness of Him. 
And that's who I'm talking to today in this room. I'm talking to a generation of people who is going to take this city by storm, who is going to be a witness, who is going to be filled with fire, who is going to move in God's supernatural power to make a mark in this final hour, in this final day of time. You are not going to just be a witness, but you are going to be used in this last day revival. Canada needs this. Canada needs the fire. And you will carry it to your generation. See, where you go, God's presence go. Where you go, healing goes. Where you go, miracles, signs, and wonder follow. Where you go, the lame walk. The blind will see. The deaf will hear. The dead will raise. There is a boldness where you go. The supernatural will follow you. Whether that be back to school. If we're going to September on vacation to the grocery market, there's going to be an urge. It is, hey, I have a word for you. Hey, why are you limping? What happened? Do you know Jesus can heal you? There's going to be something bubbling on the inside of you that's going to cause men and women alike to come to hear what you have to say. And you're not just going to talk about Jesus. 1 Corinthians 4.20, that the kingdom of God is not of word, but it is of power. Say this with me. The power to talk right. I was very Methodist. I guess I'll work on this. The power to live right. The power over temptation. The power over sickness. The power over disease. The power over depression. The power over the devil. You cannot fulfill your spiritual assignment in the natural. You need the supernatural power of God. And you could see this. Look at Stephen. Stephen is the only evangelist ever recorded in the Bible. And when he went, it says that Stephen, he, he went to Elycrium and he preached Christ unto them. And many marveled and came to hear what he had to say because they saw the signs, miracles, and the one. You cannot preach this book without seeing healings. You can't preach this book without seeing miracles. You can't preach this book without seeing demons leaving off of people. You can't see this book without being people completely set free. You can't preach and teach this book without supernatural provision. Yeah, I went there. I know people hate prosperity, but it's part of your covenant. And a lot of people are afraid of it, but I'm not ashamed of prosperity. I'm not only, I'm extreme prosperity. <laughs> Maybe I will, right? One of the most hated prosperity preacher, preachers, Kenneth Copeland. One of the most hated. But he, he's done more waking up this morning and putting on his briefs than most preachers have done their entire ministry. Like, do, do you know... Jesus said in Mark chapter 10, 20 to 30, this is totally side tangent. But Jesus said, whatever you give up here in this life and in the next, you will receive 100 times more along with persecution. He is the most persecuted person who talks and preaches about prosperity. Did you know that Kenneth Copeland was, before he was a, a preacher and a pastor, he was a pilot? Did you know he, he rode and took along the likes of Oral Roberts, Ryan Hart Bonke, Billy Graham? Did you know he took them out on his expense? Did you know he was one of Ryan Hart Bonke's biggest supporters? Did you know he, he sowed a $40 million seed to have a crusade where 1.6 million Africans can hear the gospel of Jesus? Where over 1.1 million people gave their lives to Christ for the very first time? You didn't know that, did you? But all you hear is about, oh, he has this. He has. Do you, do you know right now he's helping the, this pastor in Lagos, Nigeria, an Islamic state, build the largest indoor auditorium, which is the church on this planet? It's a church that's going to house 150,000 people. Revival is breaking out in this world, and he has his hand 
uh, on it. Not only that, he teaches people, invest in the gospel, invest in building the kingdom of God. And if you have been living under a rock, that takes money. This is what prosperity is for. Not jewelry and cars. To advance the kingdom. Jesus said, seek ye the kingdom first, then all these things shall be added unto you. Not convinced? Job 36, 11. If you listen and obey me, you will spend your days in prosperity and your years in pleasure. Proverbs 10, 22. The blessing of the Lord makes a man rich and he adds no sorrow. Proverbs 8, 21. Those who love me shall inherit wealth. I will fill their treasuries. That's in the Bible. That's God covenant with you if you decide to partner up in this area. If you hate prosperity here, you're going to hate in heaven walking on the streets of gold. Now back to our reading. <laughs> About the fire of God. Luke chapter 4. To do our spiritual assignment, we need supernatural help. Jesus didn't even do it alone. Luke 4, start from verse 14. Then Jesus returned to Galilee, and he was filled with what? The Holy Spirit's power. Man, i got to stop stopping, but you know what really grinds my gears? I can't watch a lot of Christian shows, a lot of Christian uh, TV shows. I know there's some okay ones, but I hate how they depict Jesus. It's always some effeminate British guy. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall inherit thee. And whenever he it's always like this majestic, slow. It's all. If you read the Bible, you will understand Jesus' nature, his character. He's, they say that he was not like some person who taught the law. He spoke and taught with authority. Demons fle fled, flee, fleed, fled, fled. Right, Jen, fled. What? The only, only teacher here, so she's the only valid. Uh... <laughs> yeah. They fled at the sound of his voice. He was someone that carried authority. When you read the book of John, and you see him in the garden of Gethsemane, you would see that. The, the soldiers come in. Jesus is there by himself. And then Judas comes up to him and he says, hey, who are you looking for? And they said, we're looking for the one called Jesus. Jesus takes a step in the entire gardens out on their back. And he said, I said, who are you looking for? He was someone that who carried and walked with power. And he did so what? Because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. If Jesus had to be filled, how much more us? He's the perfect and shining example. Remember what I read earlier. The same works you saw me do, ye shall do also and greater. And uh, I want to finish up, but I want to show you this, uh, this, this last video. Because this is what our generation needs. This is why you need to continue to fan the flame. This is why you continue to live in the supernatural. This is why you need to continue to have fire. Because there are people who all they encountered was religion. All they encountered was, was hatred. Oh, you're being con condemned. They've never had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And as his ambassador, as his representative, we carry what he carries, and we ought to demonstrate what he demonstrated. And when we do it the same way that he did, we will have the same results that he had. And I want to show you someone who, for the very first time, had an, a genuine encounter, just to put into perspective, just to give you a reminder of what your assignment is on this earth. Ma uh, Matthew 28, go out and make disciples of all men. If you guys want to, just want to play that.
This is why our generation needs the gospel. If you look at the current stats of what's going on in this world, depression's at an all-time high. Opioid addiction's at an all-time high. Drug use, drug abuse is at an all-time high. Suicide amongst young children, I'm, not, I'm talking about under 14, is at an all-time high. Home abuse, spousal abuse, all-time high. These lockdowns have done no good for nobody. There is no pill. There is no prescription. The only thing that can set this world, this nation, this generation free is a genuine encounter with the Holy Ghost. In the last few verses from, from uh, Luke 4 that I read, 7 verse 18, Jesus said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, for He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor, to make the blind see, to set the oppressed free, and to declare that the time of the Lord's favor has now come. It's not time for the enemy. It's time for the favor of the Lord. It's time for people, men and women. I'm talking about the people here in this room. If you're watching online, I can't say much about it. But there's people who made the effort and decision to get into the house. Because as a command from Hebrews 12, as you see these signs approaching, uh, gather even more so. That's a command. It's not a suggestion. So I'm talking to men, girls and boys here in this place, men and women, who made the decision to come here. To be filled, I'm telling you, you are going to carry and finish the task that God has for you. You are going to be like the Apostle Paul, where he said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my race. I have kept my faith. Now all that awaits me is the crown of righteousness that is to come. That will be your story until the day of Jesus' returns. And if you messed up really hard, if, if you left the faith for a bit, if you realize that, hey, I have not been living an on-fire life. I've been lukewarm. I've wasted years. Scripture tells us, Jesus said that I will give you back the years that the locusts ate. If you make the decision right now to get back on track, to forget about religion, I'm going to do the assignment that God has given me. And I'm going to finish strong. You will finish with acceleration. You will surpass every single thing that you have ever thought. Be not by your strength, not by your power, but by His Spirit, says the Lord. So everybody in this place, get on your feet while we close up in prayer. I want to pray for people. This is Revelation chapter 3. Jesus said, be hot or cold. If you are lukewarm, I will spew you out of my mouth. And then he says, now turn away from your indifference. You know what indifference is? Indifference is nothing. Indifference is coming to church, coming in the same and leaving the same. Indifference is consistently going through same cycles. Indifference is not having an expectation, not having a desire move for God. Indifference is forgetting about your call, purpose, and assignment. Indifference is going through the motion that the rest of the world is going through. Any dead fish can swim downstream. It takes an active person, someone who is willing, someone who is on fire, someone who knows a call. Hey, I am going to go against the grain and do and accomplish a task that God has for me. If you've been during this whole time that you've realized, hey, I haven't been doing what God specifically told me. I've stopped hearing his voice. I've now become somewhere in the middle. I'm not on fire, but I'm not called. I'm somewhere in between. I want you to get up on this altar and consecrate yourself and make that dedication. Make that change that how it started will not be how it finishes. I am going to finish on fire for Christ. Kimbro shate 